that's the title of the talk. That's my uh, website and my Twitter handle on there. I did have time to make a slide for this conference. It took two minutes to edit that, so it doesn't appear on the on the film as something else. Teal shade of agile. Do you recognise that picture behind there, anybody? Yeah. yeah. Where do you see it? It is the manifesto picture, isn't it? It's been there for 15 years now. It's the same picture. It's been there 15 years. I just made it a different colour. So th the question is why teal? And some of you here might be familiar with the term. And I'm imagining a lot of people are not. So I will talk about that a bit. Why the colour teal? So there's a book that came out a few years back now uh, by a man called Frederick Laloon. It's called Reinventing Organisations. And the book is essentially an investigation into companies that are working in very different ways to uh, most other companies these days. So companies that are embracing new ways of managing, essentially, new ways of coordinating companies and building organisations that are very unorthodox. Now, Frederick Leloux is not the first person to discover this, that this kind of stuff has been going on a long time. Uh, you know, you can date it back probably a very long time. Back in the 70s, there were a lot of cooperatives that grew up where there was no management and everyone was paid an equal salary. And uh, some of those companies are still around today. I believe a company in the UK called the Futon Company began that way. They were a cooperative. Whether they still are or not, I don't know. But um, Lelou did some, uh, maybe it was a research project or something, I'm not quite sure, but he, he decided to investigate uh, the companies that were doing work differently. And from that, he put this book together um, featuring 12 different companies. And he, he attempted to pull out some uh, core principles from all of that. So what were the patterns that he was seeing across all these organizations? So that's part of what he was looking at here. And, and so... Um, I'm not going to talk in too much detail about the book, you know, there's, you can read it, or he also made a, a really good 90-minute video in which he describes most of what's in the book, um, but only focuses on, I think, two or three, perhaps four of the companies that he features in here. So this, is, this model is um, what he derived from some previous early work by... Um, group of people who named it Spiral Dynamics, and it was about the what they call the rise of consciousness of organizations. So we've got, um, the Spiral Dynamics one is a little deeper than this, but Lelou focuses on these five levels as describing certain kinds of organizations over the last thousand years or so, perhaps, perhaps more. Um, so at the very bottom, he, you, when he uses these met these col he uses these colors and he uses these metaphors to describe the kind of organization it is. So at the bottom there, the red one, he uses the metaphor of wolf pack. A red organization is an organization that essentially thrives in chaotic environments. It is um, usually run by a single boss who essentially terrorizes people into doing what he wants them to do. That might sound like the place where you work, I don't know. Probably not. Um, but an example of uh, a, red a red organization, rather, not a company, a red organization he gives is the mafia, S and mobs, and prison gangs, and things like that. So that's um, one level of consciousness. The next one is um, the, calls it amber, it looks kind of brown. Um, it's the army metaphor, and army organizations are deeply hierarchical. People always do exactly what they're supposed to do, and nothing more, nothing less. And they follow orders, essentially, so army is a good metaphor for that. The other example that he calls out there is the Catholic Church. There's a very strong uh, hierarchy in the Catholic Church, probably in, the, in other churches too, um, where people know their place and uh, you report to your superior, and you know you may move through some kind of promotion scheme, but that's not um, something you talk about. You just, you kind of, you know your place. And then the machine paradigm, which is probably the most common one around today, is, um, he, he describes that as um, companies, you know, more scientific in their, in their methods. And um, 
they operate as if they were a machine. So the idea is that people are sort of part of the system. They're like cogs in the machine, and every, everyone sort of um, follows the rules and does what they're supposed to do. Things work pretty well. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, most of the organizations we work in are like this, and so they use, they use incentives in these organizations, such as reward schemes uh, and also punishment. There's uh, often a, a, a sort of fear of losing your job hanging over you if your performance isn't um, considered to be uh, acceptable to the organization. So there's a sort of a drive to uh, help people, to actually to motivate people to, to become better. So performance is a, very, is a very strong part of that paradigm. And then, um, more recently, some organizations have been moving away from that because they're finding it's not that useful, not that successful. Um, probably in the last 30, 40 years, organizations have been experimenting with a kind of a lighter, a lighter way of working, a more friendly, a more open um, family is the, is the metaphor he uses here. So organizations that consider themselves more like a family than a sort of than a hierarchy. Now, it's not to say they don't still have hierarchies. Many of them do, probably most of them. Um, but they are um, they take care. They there's more nurture going on in a green organisation than there is in an orange organisation. There's more mentorship, perhaps, um, a sense that um, people have a voice. And there are companies like. Um, Southwest Airlines is considered to be in the, in the green zone. Um, ben and Jerry's ice cream in the USA is another one. Um, Zappos shoes would be considered to be in here. Uh, Zappos are adopting a method of working called holacracy. Some of you may have heard about, based on sociocracy, which has been around again since about the 1970s. It's a form of governance. It's a way to govern your organisation, removing hierarchies. Both of them use a system of circles rather than rather than hierarchies. And circles in that system are what they call double-linked. So you've always got someone from below representing that group and someone from the group rep and someone from the above group representing as well. So there's more of an egalitarian feel to it. Um, and then there's this living organism one, which is the teal one. And according to his research, very, very few companies are up there. So it's the next, as he says, the level of consciousness that we're seeking in, in organizational change. So I'll talk a bit more about Teal in a moment. It's interesting, actually, because I, before I read this book, I read a book by, um, gosh, I can't think of his name for a moment, but it's called Tribal Leadership, Dave Logan. People know that? And Dave Logan has an interesting five-step model of organizational consciousness as well, but he has different kind of metaphors. He thinks about it differently, but there's a nice overlap in a way. If I remember it, the bottom level, to sum it up, I mean, it's a big book, right? I'm summing it up in five sentences. Um, at the bottom level is, um, life sucks, thank you. Alexis has read it. Um, life sucks. And the next level up is slightly better than that. It's just, my life sucks. And then the third level up is, I'm okay, you suck. Or I'm great. I think it's I'm great. You, I'm okay. You suck. And then the fourth one is, oh, we're great. Everyone else sucks. So that's a we rather than an I. So on the on the third level is I, I'm, I'm great. You suck. And then the next one is we're great. Our company, our group, we're great. You suck. And the top one is life is great. So it's a similar it's a similar idea, isn't it? Uh, different different kind of language but he uses those five stages as well. So organizations that think life is great are organizations that have an eye out to the planet Earth as much as they do to their bottom line of profit. And again, that is considered to be part of a teal organization. So I don't much like these metaphors. Some of them are okay. I especially don't like the bottom one. Does anyone know anything about wolves? I didn't know much about wolves either. And someone, when I mentioned this one time on Twitter, I think someone got took real offence at the idea of a wolf pack, um, and, and she told me that um, you know the myth of having a sort of an alpha wolf is based on research done in zoos, and in the wild they don't behave that way. They behave that way because they're in captivity. Um, so all of the research was um, shown to be um, fake, false, basically uh, unfounded, 
And the person who did that research and wrote the paper withdrew it, essentially accepted that it was wrong. So wolves actually live like families, so they're much more, wolves are really in the green area. So it's not a good metaphor. Um, and so we can start, you know, but it doesn't matter. It, may, it means something to the person that wrote this, and, it, and it, it gives the idea as soon as you start kind of expanding the metaphor and giving some examples of organizations. But I, I was just thinking about maybe um, thinking of some other terms that might go in there in the way that I see organizations. Because I've been, I've been doing agile transformational stuff and, and coaching and... Uh, well, not really coaching, consulting really, and, and, and education in organizations. So I get, have been to see quite a lot of different companies. And um, I would use this term. I've never been in a company. I've never been in a red company, by the way. I haven't worked, I haven't done Agile with the Mafia. Not yet. Um, so, but there's an, anarchist, an anarchistic feel to, to being down there. You know, it's just like very reactive and having to deal with kind of what's going on and, uh, uh, and kind of taking control of things that are really out of your control. And then the next one is a commanding paradigm. Uh, it's very much like an army thing, of course. So it's you know, very uh, important people in charge of less important people. And the third one is a controlling one. And that's, again, that's the kind of organizations that we see today. Most of them uh, have uh, control mechanisms in place to make sure that people do what they're supposed to do. And when they fall out of line, they get hauled into a, a meeting with HR or with their manager or something like that. So there's a lot of control over making sure things are done in the way they're supposed to be done. And then this one, um, I actually would coin the term paternalistic there, which is not such a friendly term as family. Um, but I think that the question there comes up for me, when we talk about families, you know, what is our model for families? And, and sadly, it's still a very paternalistic one. It's a man in charge of the group. Uh, that's the vision that many people still have of families, and that's how um, intentionally or unintentionally, that's how most of these organizations in the green zone tend to play out. So um, years ago, I came across an organizational health index. And um, command and con control was fairly low in the hierarchy in that index. And the next one above that, straight away, was um, paternalistic. That was considered to be also a very weak model of management. And then the top one is uh, a paradigm of releasing. So we've got anarchistic, commanding, controlling, paternalistic, and releasing. So letting go of the control, letting go of the command, trusting people more. But what's interesting about that is it kind of loops around to some extent. So it may not be linear in the way that um, Lulu is presenting it here. And even, in, even though spiral dynamics is a spiral, it's still an upward one only. There is no, there's only one direction that it goes, and it goes up. But the idea that um, people's consciousness in, or organizational consciousness is um, improving all the time. I did this talk once before, which is why I have it. And um, afterwards, someone came up to me and said, whose consciousness are you talking about? And I thought that was a really great question because I had to stop and think. And uh, as a white male, I'm probably talking about white male consciousness. She was a woman. She had a different sense of what consciousness meant. So it got me kind of like digging further into some research around that. Um, but so what I'm thinking is maybe it's not linear. It may be that there are elements in the red zone, the kind of um, anarchistic approach where there is a lot of release. You know, even though a mafia boss might have all the power and basically kills people that, uh, who he doesn't like or who did something wrong. Um, there's a lot of release there because that person or that group of people can't control what people do when they're away from them. So they're given missions or they're given things they have to do and they have to accomplish and there's a lot of freedom in that. So there's some release from um, in that zone that gets taken away as we move up the thing. So when we're talking about giving release, that we have to deal with the fact that we might be introducing anarchy again. Uh, there's a great danger of that. That is why a lot of people are afraid of Agile. You may have come across this. It sounds like anarchy is what they say. And in some cases, it becomes that because people don't appreciate the importance of vision and boundaries in order to contain the anarchy or to contain the chaos. So it's not as simple, I don't think, as it's always sort of pictured in these um, linear diagrams. It's also interesting, let me see where I'm going next. I haven't rehearsed this, as you can probably tell. The top one, uh, I'm, I'm now renaming it the promised land. 
this is apparently where, where organizations need to strive for, perhaps want to strive for in some cases. And um, these are the important breakthroughs that he calls out in his book. And there's only three principles that he believes um, would make an organization move into that zone if they were played out effectively. Self-management, now, of course, that's very familiar to people working in the agile spells. We call it self-organization. Some people call it self-management. I think it means pretty much the same thing. The second one is wholeness, which we haven't talked about so much in our space, which is really concerns the people in organizations and how they show up for work, who they show up as. Are they putting on a facade? Are they a different? In fact, all of, this, all of the work over the last couple of decades around work-life balance implies that people are different at work than they are at home. It says that well, you're one thing at home and you're another thing at work, and somehow you have to balance these two things out. The newer thinking around that is, is be whole at work. So when you come to work, you're not a different person. You're not leaving your emotional self at home. You're allowed to bring it to work. And of course, that can come with some problems too. And the third one is quite interesting. I think it's probably the one that's... Um, was newest to me when I heard about it. I've, I've thought a lot about, you know, when I'm doing Agile, I talk about evolutionary vision statements. Like if you've got a, a vision for a product, you have to be open to the fact that that vision uh, can and probably will change between the time you come up with it and the time that you release the product. There'll be changes to that, and you need to be aware of that. It's not a vision statement for a product. It's not a fixed thing. But I hadn't really thought about it for a purpose of an entire organization. So he's got this idea that an organization at that level is, in, is a living organism. And with a living organism, you can't quite, well, you can't at all, in fact, predict what's, what's going to happen. It's all about how the environment is, not about what that cat or dog or fish wants to be. It's about a fish is going to develop very differently in captivity or in uh, uh, soiled water than it is in fresh water. Um, and the wolves one is an ex a great example of that. Wolves change their behavior when they're in captivity. So the environment changes things. And so evolutionary purpose, what is the environment around the organization? It means we have to keep an eye on that. We have to be aware of it. We have to listen to our users and customers perhaps much more than we're already doing. Uh, and allow the organization itself to change direction and become something it isn't. I mean, there are examples of that. And, and I wouldn't say those companies are in the, t in the, in the um, teal zone at all, but a company like Amazon evolved from a company that only sold books to a company that sells pretty much everything you can possibly want and has in the process put many other companies out of business. So it evolved. But it evolved in, uh, again, in a single direction. It just got bigger and bigger and bigger and took on more and more of the world. Um, there's not many, I don't, well, I'm sure there are, but I, I don't really know of any or can't think of any off the top of my head of companies that started out as one thing and became something really quite different. So Amazon, if, although it evolved its purpose to get bigger and wider, it didn't really change what it does. It's buy stuff online. That was its model, essentially. That's the same model. But um, you know, other businesses, other small startups may have um, ways of rediscovering themselves. So the promised land, the teal land, I think, um, for me anyway, and I think for most of us who practice Agile in one form or another, and perhaps the, the, the longer we do it, the deeper we go into it, the more we see that this is an absolute necessity. And the struggle we have is that Agile is contained, in a sense, to software development and um, kind of its immediate surroundings. Dave Snowden was talking about that a little before. So Agile wants to live here, and it knows it belongs here, but it can't get in. So the question is, what's preventing it? And my sense is that, that, that I'm preventing it, and so are you. So we, we as human beings, trying to make these changes, we're the ones that actually prevent it. Uh, and we don't know we're preventing it very often because we're following patterns um, at work and through, through the consulting and coaching that we do that we have likely picked up in a paradigm that was very different to the Agile paradigm, very different to the Teal paradigm. And we can't help but bring that stuff in. And um, without you know, really stepping back and doing a lot of introspection and kind of uh, honoring your observing self, you, you just won't know. So part of the problem of being able to recreate an organization or transform an organization is that we don't have the right, we don't have a language for it. The only language we know is the language from the paradigm where we live. 
So it, it creates a problem because we want to talk about a different way of working, but we can only talk about it from a way of working that we're familiar with. We can only describe it from that way. For example, look what happened to Agile. As I said in my brief overview this morning, uh, Agile was invented by software developers who were very frustrated about the way they were being asked to work, knew there were better ways, and did their best to start seeking those out. So a lot of skunk work projects occurred, um, and, and people confronted management and said, you know, we need to explore these different ways. And as you know, from the picture at the beginning, Agile Manifesto got put together by 17 different people who were practicing this stuff. And they said, we are uncovering better ways of developing software. And then they give some values about how they're doing it. But this picture, <coughs> this is actually the same picture that's in my later presentation. It's, I like it. It's the Kent Beck drawing. Or it's a little, it looks like a painting, actually, doesn't it? The, the, per, the point I'm using it for is that it's, it's throwaway. It's like a napkin top sketch. It's something that you can imagine him sitting down with two or three coding buddies and just kind of say, what is it we're seeking here? And just kind of playing around and exploring and brainstorming, essentially. And they would come up with pictures like this. And then, you know, maybe a week later or a month later, they'd throw it away and do, and do it better. Um, but what happens is things like that occur now. They get published and printed and distributed around an organization, and that becomes the agile way of this organization, which, of course, is not agile at all, because it's now static. The word agile does not mean nailed down and fixed and clear and uh, everyone follows the same rules. That's not agile. It's the antithesis of agile. And I, you know, this is just a random picture from a Google search for Agile diagram. And there are many, so many, that look like this or worse. It's not that it's wrong. And I don't know, I haven't looked at it in detail. It's not that it's wrong, but the fact is that it's so many companies, and I've, I've engaged with many of them too, and try, and try and sort of help them rethink this idea. It's like, well, we've got this team doing Scrum, or we've got this team doing something, you know, Agile, XP, and it's working really well. So we need to know what they're doing, and we need to write it down so other teams can do it too. But they just don't see the irony of, of, of that remark. So that's what happens to Agile. The diagram here, let's go back. This is a very organic looking diagram. And it is, as I said, it's a throwaway thing. It's like developers, are dip the most important tool for a software developer I think, well, I was told this when I, when I very first started studying software development. They said to me, the most important tool for you is a pencil. Well, now it's a whiteboard, because we're collaborating more. Um, but it was about, you don't just sit at a keyboard. The keyboard is not a, an important tool for software developers at all, because it's a thinking profession, not a typing profession. This is not an organic diagram. This is a very static, mechanical-looking diagram where you do, you do A, and B will follow. If you do this, then that will happen, and then this has to happen, and then you can do that. It's an if, if, then. So here is interesting. In, in, in the book itself, and in many uh, web pages around this, they're describing a teal way of working using orange language, using charts and grids and uh, concentric circles, and the usual consultants' tools, triangles probably. All consultants love triangles, don't they? Or, or quadrants, it's something there's four things. Dave Snowden's Kinef in one isn't exactly a quadrant, because there's a lot more dynamic stuff going on in there. But essentially, if you just looked at the picture, you go, oh, it's another consultant's quadrant. Um, and so here's a nice, um, you know, it's a nice sort of orange view nicely gridded up and columned and everything. So, you know, you could come out with that in a spreadsheet, probably. And again, it's because, well, how else do I present it? You know, I've got to show it. I've got to write it down. I've got to show it. We don't know what other methods to use. Maybe there are no other methods, but I, there may be. I believe there are. And uh, things like this. It's not that they're unclear. Uh, again, this is modeling what, what Teal needs to look like um, using the traditional orange flavored consultant model. And this is a slightly expanded view. I think someone has kind of um, blended spiral dynamics with um, the lose model. 
because they go down a couple stages deeper. When I saw this, though, I thought it was interesting because authority by the elders implying kind of um, uh, tribal methods of governance. Um, I've, I've read quite a bit about that, and it's incredibly powerful, and we could learn an awful lot from actually reflecting back on that, and we don't, because we think in our arrogance that our consciousness is up here and their consciousness was down here. And I've been more and more beginning to sort of challenge that in myself and, and challenge myself to look into this more deeply. Again, I think it might be much more circular than it is just going up. The, the problem with just going up, even though you might in, 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 intend to include the good stuff of what was at the level below, often it just gets thrown away. And sometimes it should get thrown away, but in this process of throwing, what is that lovely phrase, throwing out the baby with the bathwater. You know, we're emptying the bath, but we threw the baby away as well. Um, where the baby had value, but the bathwater didn't. And so we may have lost something from those very low down foraging bands and um, uh, hunter-gatherer tribes and the way that they organize themselves and the distribution of power is very, very interesting. It, there really isn't, in a, in a typical hunter-gatherer tribe, there really isn't a position of power. There are elders who just happen to know more because they've been around um, and the culture is around storytelling and now storytelling is something that you may know is coming back uh, quite strongly in the business world. People, a lot of these consultants are now saying, talking about telling stories, stories of the organization or metaphorical stories to help people understand things. They knew how to do that, and we have to almost learn it from scratch because we've forgotten. So we're dipping down into that again in order to get to this, this um, promised land of teal. Now, these are the sort of pictures in the, in the green paradigm. They're slightly different. In the, the green paradigm um, really enjoys things like value statements. They like to have um, strongly encoded value statements that everyone in the company is expected to follow. Uh, Zappos has, an, has one, and uh, they all do. Um, and then there's a whole movement towards, and again, this is something Dave mentioned this morning, the, the happiness at work syndrome. As if happiness was something you can package and uh, have people buy, or you can distribute to people, have, you know, here, have some happiness. I think people actually are naturally happy, and what an organization does, an organization a workplace can't make you happy, but it sure as hell can make you very unhappy. And I think rather than focusing on making people happy, which becomes a facade on top of their misery, you might actually instead focus on not making them unhappy. And that might work. And this is true in, in so many uh, of, the, of those nominalizations that we use, and things like motivation. How do I motivate my organization? Or stop demotivating them, and then, and then start thinking about that. Um, how do I make my organization, how do I make my team self-organized? It drives me crazy, that question. Go away, and they will. You can bet you will. And then you can see what the results of that are. Now you might have to do some nurturing of the environment in order to get the results you want with these naturally self-organizing people. So um, the trouble with the encoding things is they immediately build up resistance. It's remaining time. Um, as soon as I, I came across a, a, a value statement that told me I had to have fun at work, my reaction was just, no, I don't, and I'm not going to now. <laughs> I'm going to walk around with a miserable face because I just feel miserable. I feel annoyed at that, you telling me that I have to be, uh, have fun at work. So it has, sometimes has the opposite effect on, on certain people. Here's another one, team spirit. I worked at a company once that had one of these things. And one of their values was, we work as teams. We value teamwork. And the organization was set up so every single person there was in a gray cubicle with walls on three sides, or three and a half sides. And every, um, every year, they had a performance review where people were rated and ranked against each other in a competitive way. How on earth is that valuing teamwork? So these just become nominalization. They just become words that we feel like saying because they're the trendy words of the time. They mean nothing. So be aware of those. Fun at work. You might even recognize that one, given the footprint. It's not that it's bad. You know, of course, people want to have these things in their lives, but we need to figure it out for ourselves. We need to discover it, not have a manager tell us that we have to be these things. I think on one version of this that I've seen about have fun and the little weirdness, they were very specific about what a little weirdness meant. 
there was a there was like a limit to how weird you could be at work. And it's, so you're trying to comply now to a new set of rules, which are really confusing because they're not like the old set. It was easy to comply to the old set of rules, which is just do this, do that. This is like, well, you can have a little bit of this, but not too much. And like, you know, what does that mean? How How weird can I be? <laughs> Well, am I weird now? I don't even know. Are people considering me weird? Is that why they made that value statement for me? And now, yeah, you know, so there's, you get the point. That's the language of teal. It's a blank sheet of paper. And in fact, that might actually be too specific. It might not be that at all. It might actually be that. It might not even be paper. We don't know what it is. We don't know how to talk in this language yet because none of us live in that space, so we haven't learned it. We haven't learned it because it doesn't exist, right? So we have to invent it. We have to discover it. So we, and I think in order to do that, we have to go outside of the business world. Because if you're trying to improve business from within business, you end up in a closed system. So you've got to draw knowledge and information from un unexpected places. Maybe uh, visual arts and poetry and dance or uh, psychotherapy uh, or biology or physics in order to actually start creating a new language for ourselves. So. <coughs> We have the same problem um, that we, we, we have when you're trying to shift a paradigm. So um, in Scrum, when people who are stuck in the orange paradigm first heard about Scrum Masters, they would go, oh, Scrum Master's like a project manager. And that would lock into their head, and then they would pigeon the Scrum Master as a sort of a junior project manager. And others would say, oh, Scrum Master's like a delivery manager, or a Scrum Master's like an engineering manager. And so they pigeonholed the Scrum Master into the boxes they already had because they didn't know how to create a new box. And the Scrum Master, I'm talking about the Scrum Master role a bit later on today. Scrum Master is nothing like any of those things. It is a completely new role, and people don't know what to do with it. So they just say, this is like that. The more we try to make sense of either with existing language, the more we end up with that. Aha, this is like that. But it isn't. So how do we talk about self-managed wholeness and evolutionary purpose? So the, the, you know, the response we often get in, in um, Scrum when we're talking about um, self-organization is, oh, that will result in chaos, as I said earlier. Wholeness at work. Everyone will bring their personal problems to work. That's the fear of it, right? If you say, you know, show up with all your emotions, it's going to be an, an emotional weeping festival at work. And um, we don't want that either. So there's a misunderstanding of what being whole at work means. It doesn't mean laying yourself out in all of your gore and glory. It means just being who you are, containing yourself, but showing up as those things. You don't have to share it all. There's this idea somewhere that in, from, I don't know, from all these team building things, I think, from the 80s and 90s, that, that people are going to expose their souls to their teammates. They do in those getaways, and then they really regret it later. An emergent purpose sounds wishy-washy. You know, we, we must have a very clear and firm goal. We have to go towards that goal. If we don't have a clear goal, we have nothing. So what language do we use? And that's the answer. I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea what the language is we should use. But in a sense, that in itself is the language. It's that. It's the language of not knowing, which means that we have to now be courageous enough when we respond to things to say, I don't know. We're so solution focused in the orange paradigm. It's all about solving problems. That's the focus. And the people who are rewarded are the people who are the best problem solvers. But the best problem solvers don't necessarily come up with the best solutions. They just come up with a solution. Uh, there's a lovely quote that I'm trying to think of for a moment, but I can't think of it, so I have to just move on. But this quote, so when, I'm, when I, it wasn't yesterday, like literally, I said, when I first did this presentation, I, at the last minute I added this because I had just got this, I suppose it's feedback from a session I had run, a two day workshop I had run. And the guy wrote this blog post and he opened with this. And I shared this with a colleague of mine, and he said, oh, I dream of getting feedback like that. <laughs> so is it positive or negative? Okay. It's hard to know, isn't it? Because I've isolated it, of course, from the rest of what he was writing about. But the point was that I didn't give people um, 
patterns or models or processes or procedures or tools. There was no none of that. It was all about kind of discovery of self, I suppose, really. And uh, people didn't quite know what to do with that, and that is good, because they had to leave there saying, I don't know what, I don't know. Uh, and I think when you start to be able to enter the don't know space, um, there's going to be some chaos, for sure, internal chaos. But something new will be born from that if you stay with it and don't hide it and don't be afraid of it. So that is my, my take, very quick take on um, the, the Teal paradigm and how agile people like ourselves might want to explore it and begin to investigate. The, the key thing I think that Teal gives us that Agile doesn't is that it is um, the way the book is structured and the way the community that's built around it is structured is it isn't about software development. It's about, it really truly is about organizational change. They talk about you cannot do this unless you have the buy-in of the CEO and the board of directors. You have to have both of those things in order to proceed. Now, there are things about that statement I don't particularly like because I think best change happens grassroots upwards. So um, my concern, if I'm getting involved in this field at all, is to say, well, where's the, where's the grassroots change going to happen? Because if you just change it top down, you end up with another management-imposed solution to people. And people, I've already seen people resist management-imposed teal because it's scary. Um, and so they have to have a sense that it belongs to me as well. And now what? Yeah, that's the end. Now what? That's, your, that's the thing to leave with. We've got like two minutes if you want to ask any quick questions around it. And I'll run over with the mic. Yes. Yeah, it, you, it was a great talk. I really enjoyed it, Tobias. Uh, just one question for me to understand. Uh, like, uh, knowing the history of XP and Scrum, right? XP it, it came from Chrysler, I think, and Scrum was born in uh, Borland. These are probably orange organizations, right? Yes. And but Agile Manifesto is formed in a green language, right? Is for, for, for is articulated in green language, I guess, be, because it's about values in the Agile Manifesto. I guess that's true. And now we're saying that it's, uh, teal is agile. So how is this? Teal is agile. I'm not. I'm not sure saying that. No, you didn't say that, right? Um, so you think the similarity between those two things? Okay. Though, yeah. But, you know, in order to change anything, you've got to start from where you are. So how many of you are coaches in this room? Right? In coaching, people talk about meeting a client where they are, right? Uh -huh. You don't just come in and drag them somewhere. You work with them and let them come on a journey with you. So I think it's a bit like that with XP. They were hoping that the organization would come on the journey with them, and they didn't. Um, and that happens so frequently. You know, we start off and there's some initial excitement about it. But when, um, in any um, change effort, Things always go up first. There's a level of excitement, and then they go down. Because if you're changing, you discover things you didn't know were there before. Scrum is very good at that, showing you, holding up a mirror to your organization and showing you uh, where all the dysfunction is, where all the problems are. And then you've got to do something about it. Because Scrum isn't like a magic wand that you wave and everything goes away. It's just like, OK, here's the problems. What will you do? And then things go into this churning, chaotic phase where you're actually getting worse in terms of like output delivered. You're getting worse. But if you stay with it and go through the curve, you come up really high on the other side. But if you back off at that point, you either revert back to where, where you were before, you might have a very slight incremental improvement. So it's how much courage do you have and how much money do you have to lose? Of course, that's another question too. Did that answer it? I didn't uh, really had a question, so it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> I was just uh, thinking aloud ab yeah, about, about the colors right. because... Yeah. Uh, what, what you're saying, in fact, is I don't know <laughs> what my question was. Even. I don't know my question. Um, for, for the red um, layer, you've said uh, ana anarchistic. Could, could you put barbarism in there, or is barbarism slightly higher? So barbarism, they do have some sort of structure, but it's basically... Um, slay everyone and and worry about it later isn't it barbarism so the bar yeah. barbaric barbaric doesn't look to learn or grow so they barbarism do sometimes i think they do sometimes and sometimes yeah, yeah i think there are stories certainly from the old testament where uh, uh, where the um invaders were basically looking to murder and kill everyone but there are times when um if people come to them in peace they actually em embrace them into the community and therefore 
they will learn because there's a different culture now living among them. Uh, so it's all about if they come in in servitude, for example. So it's probably a cycle then. So you have a cycle from um, teal level back down to red. We have a cycle within that sort of orange, red as well. Yeah, barbarism. just be really clear that that cyclic thing has nothing to do with the book. <laughs> That's just me, right? That's just me thinking about this in, in some, some, a somewhat different way based on other learnings I've had. Uh, Hi, I uh, wanted to thank you for the talk. Uh, just, I have the following question. Uh, you talked a lot about, uh, in general, why it may be interesting for the, you know, employees, why it's uh, needed for the teams, uh, what is the value for it, and so on and so forth. Uh, though, at the end, you mentioned that it obviously cannot happen uh, without any, like, buy-in from the top management. And as we know, in general, in, like, average company, currently, we are in the stage where Top management is pretty mercantile because at the end of the day, the you know ultimate objective of the organization is to gain more money, be more efficient, and so on and so forth. How would you, in like maybe in short, if you can uh, elaborate about it now, uh, how would you sell it to the top management? What would be the key points? Why they need this to is what a lot of consultants are asking because they can see the shiny new package. Uh, the agile thing's burnt out a little bit, and they're looking for something new. So how do you sell it? Um, and I don't know. I'm not trying to sell it, so I, I have no experience of that. Um, but there are people trying to do that. Uh, you know, I, I suppose if you're an agile um, coach or consultant working with an organization now, you might begin to introduce those ideas and see if people get interested. But I want to close very, with a very quick story about uh, one company I had experience of. The, the management and the board of directors were bought into this idea. I don't know if they were using the term teal, but they were certainly influenced by the book. And, th and they wanted to introduce some of these ideas of self-management. And there's one company written about in the book that has a process called the, um, the advice process. And the advice process is a decision-making process. So traditionally, decisions are made at the top of the organization, and people are just told the decision's made, and now this is the new rule. What they said is that if anything needs to change, anyone in the organization can change it. All we ask of you is that you talk to other people and get advice on how the change might impact them and then you can go ahead and do what you feel is right. So there's no permission at all required in that. Now, one company has been doing this for a decade or more, and it's been really successful because they sort of grew up with it, I suppose. It became just part of their culture. So any employee makes any decision they need to make. And um, so this company tried to introduce that because stuff wasn't getting done. So they said to the development team of about 25 people, if you don't like the way you're working, you don't like the tools you're using, you can change them. And, and they couldn't change them. They were unable to actually take any action. They froze, essentially. I went in there to do a, a kind of reflection meeting with them to talk about um, you know, wh what are the problems with the organization. And, and you know, that thing in retrospect is where you say, what's in your power? What's in your control? What can you influence? And what is completely outside of your influence? And um, so we moved these cards around. And they all shifted up in, to me, the wrong direction. I was surprised. I thought, wait, you've got this advice process. You, can, you have a lot of control here. They put everything in, almost everything is I have no, no control whatsoever. And there was a few things in I can influence, and there was one thing in I can change this. And that one thing was um, we need more Coke in the Coke machine. They were happy to change that. The rest of it, they wanted to let go. And the reason I thought about this afterwards, I was so puzzled by it. And I thought about it afterwards, and I thought, well, there's a few reasons here. One is they just completely don't trust their management because they've been working in a very strict command and control, um, very uh, customer-driven way where it's like um, demands are coming in frequently. They're having to constantly meet those demands. I know I'm running over a minute. Um, and uh, So they didn't trust the management. The second one was they didn't sign up for that. They signed up to be told what to do. That was, that was what they went to that company for, perhaps. You know, they, in the interview, this is your manager. This is what you're going to be assigned. You're going to be get assigned work by this person, and you're going to do it. And now suddenly they're being told they have to make managerial decisions. And I bet no one offered them a salary increase for that either. So it doesn't always, you know, just because we get the buy-in at the high level, it doesn't mean anything's going to change at all. I would suggest they may have even got worse in terms of decision-making as a result of that. Because now it's visible, whereas before they could might change things and, and hide it. Now they have to expose it. They stop doing it altogether. It's a puzzle. Thank you very much. Uh